Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. Out of around 11,000 people imprisoned in the United Kingdom, just over 70 of those have committed crimes so terrible that they were given whole life sentences. Some of those people include Ian Brady, Rose West, Harold Shipman, but then there's the lesser known cases, those that don't get as much attention but are equally horrific. One of those people is Anthony Arkwright. Anthony Arkwright was born in 1967 in the small mining town of Wath upon Dern in Rotherham, South Yorkshire. By all accounts, Arkwright's childhood was one of neglect and deprivation. When he was very young, his mother walked out on him and his four siblings, leaving him in the sole care of his father, who worked at the local mines. As you can imagine, a man who works long hours down the pit wouldn't have been able to devote much time to the raising of five children. It was during this time that Anthony was moved between various care homes. The young Anthony Arkwright began to show the usual attention-seeking traits of a boy raised without proper parental supervision. He was known as a troublemaker, constantly getting into fights and committing petty acts of vandalism and theft. He was eventually expelled from school and soon afterwards he did a stretch in Borstal, which is what youth detention facilities were known as back then. Once out of Borstal, Arkwright began to burgle houses and he spent much of his late teens and early twenties in and out of prison. It was during this time that he became obsessed with serial killers. He spent a lot of time in the prison library reading books about Peter Sutcliffe and Jack the Ripper. He loved the notoriety that these men had got from their crimes. It appealed to his own narcissistic need for recognition and infamy. He began to fantasize about leaving his own gruesome mark on history. He even boasted to his fellow inmates that he would one day be as famous as Jack the Ripper. By 1988, the 21-year-old Arkwright was out of prison and roaming the streets of Wath upon Dern once again. By this time, most of the British mining industry was in severe decline, leaving mining towns like Wath severely deprived. He moved into his father's flat on Denham Road and he found work at a nearby scrapyard. This doesn't mean that he was on the straight and narrow though. He was still known locally to be a petty criminal and a violent bully. Life on Denham Road brought Arkwright into contact with a number of troubled characters. One of these was a neighbour named Marcus Law. Marcus was wheelchair bound and he lived in a specially adapted bungalow near to Anthony's flat. Arkwright thought of Marcus as being a scrounger who was constantly asking to borrow cigarettes off him. This seems to have been a point of contention between the two of them and sometime towards the end of August they'd gotten into a big argument over a packet of cigarettes. He also had a neighbour named Raymond Ford. This was a retired teacher who had fallen into a black hole of depression and alcoholism and he rarely left his flat. Arkwright saw Raymond as an easy target and he enjoyed harassing him. Arkwright had been known to post dog excrement through Raymond Ford's letterbox. Anthony Arkwright's job performance at the scrapyard was pretty abysmal. He regularly turned up for work late, if he even bothered to turn up at all, and he was known to have a really bad attitude. Eventually on the 26th of August he was fired. With his final paycheck, he went to the pub and got drunk and it appears that at this point he completely snapped. It wasn't just the firing that sent him over the edge, there were other tensions ruminating in his head at that time. A week earlier he'd broken into the flat of his neighbour Raymond Ford and he'd stolen a clock and a light fitting. Raymond confronted Arkwright and told him that he knew that he was the one who broke into his flat. He said that he'd reported Arkwright to the police and so he had the imminent arrest looming over his head. 
Arkwright had also become obsessed with a rumour that he was the result of an incestuous relationship between his mother and grandfather. Now, I'm not sure if there's any truth to this story. Most sources that I've found say that it's untrue, but it was a rumour that plagued him throughout his childhood and one that seems to have occupied his thoughts more and more as he got older. It seems to be all of these factors, the sacking, the rumours, his imminent arrest, the tensions with his neighbours and the alcohol coursing through his system, he decided to fulfil his ambition of becoming as famous as Jack the Ripper. His first target was his grandfather, Starsis Poitokas. He found him tending his allotment in Mexborough. When Starsis rose to greet his grandson, Arkwright stabbed him in the neck with such force that the blade severed his spinal cord, rendering him immediately paralysed. Arkwright then dragged his grandfather into the potting shed where he grabbed an axe and buried it in the old man's chest. He finished the job by smashing in his skull with a mallet. From here he allegedly travelled to his grandfather's house and murdered his housekeeper, Elsa Conradites, smashing her repeatedly over the head with an axe. I'll explain why I say allegedly later on. After carrying out these killings, Arkwright went back drinking. He went into various pubs around Mexborough, talking to friends and neighbours of his grandfather. By all accounts he was acting very strangely, he seemed to be on a high from what he'd just done. A barman later described him as being a wild-eyed weirdo. He made a number of odd comments to people including, it's been murder on the allotment today. He even said to one person, I'll see you in 25 years, I've just done two murders. He staggered home to his flat on Denham Road at around 3am, but it seems like he still wasn't finished, he still had a thirst for violence. He was still angry about Raymond Ford reporting him to the police and so he decided to make him his next victim. He put on a plastic devil mask and entered Raymond's flat through a broken window. Once inside, he stripped off everything he was wearing except the devil mask and crept naked through the darkened flat into the living room where he found Raymond passed out in an armchair. What followed was an extremely long, drawn-out torture murder session. Raymond Ford was stabbed over 500 times, 11 of his ribs were broken in the attack. At one point he was stabbed so viciously that the blade had snapped off in the wound and Arkwright had had to fetch another knife to continue the attack. With Raymond Ford dead, Arkwright returned home and showered the blood off himself and then he went to bed. Quite why he wore the devil mask for this killing is unclear. According to one article, in the days before the killing, he haunted his intended victim by appearing in a devil mask. It appears like he'd already been using the mask to torment the unstable man and in a final act of sadism decided that the devil's face would be the last thing that Raymond Ford saw as he was slowly hacked to death. Later that day, police arrived at Arkwright's home and they took him in for questioning. The crazy thing is that at this point they had no idea that he'd just killed two and more likely three people. They were arresting him for the burglary of Raymond Ford's home. After a few hours of questioning they released him on bail, completely unaware that they'd just released a psychopathic murderer back onto the streets. Anthony Arkwright went back out drinking in the local pubs. He returned home once again in the early hours of the morning. I imagine he probably felt completely invincible at this point. He decided to kill again. This time he went into the home of Marcus Law, his wheelchair bound neighbour. Similar to Raymond Ford, Marcus was subjected to an extremely slow death, being severely beaten and stabbed over 70 times. 
Now, as I say, Arkwright wanted notoriety. He wanted to be known for these crimes. I think at this time he was probably starting to get a bit frustrated that nobody had found the bodies yet, despite the fact that he was dropping hints with anyone who would listen. Later that day, he was walking down the streets and he met Marcus Law's mother. He said to her, Sorry about poor Marcus, he's killed himself. Out of all the things that Arkwright did, to me this might be the most sadistic. He wanted Marcus's mother to find the body and he knew what she was going to find. Mrs. Law rushed to her son's house and let herself in and this is the sight that greeted her. Marcus's body lay slumped in an armchair, bloodied and slashed to pieces. His eyeballs had been gouged out and cigarettes had been stuffed into the sockets. He also had cigarettes in his ears and nostrils and other cigarettes had been arranged in the shape of a crucifix on his chest. Most horrific of all, Marcus's stomach had been hacked open and one of his crutches had been shoved deep into the open wound. Naturally, after his comments to Mrs. Law, Anthony Arkwright was the main suspect. He was quickly arrested and brought in once again for questioning. He denied killing Marcus Law, but he did act very strangely during the interrogation. He claimed that he was psychic, and then he pulled out a pack of cards. He started to flip through the cards, reading them like a tarot deck. He pulled out the Four of Hearts, placed it in front of the police, and he said to them, This is the Master card. This means you have four bodies and a madman on the loose. You found one of these, but there are three more. I can see Marcus Law, but the others are indescribable. They are just too horrible to describe. Arkwright was remanded in custody whilst the police continued their inquiries. They now had the idea that there were three more bodies to find. They searched Anthony Arkwright's home and discovered an arsenal of weapons, including knives, cudgels and homemade flails. Amazingly, they went and knocked on Raymond Ford's door, but they didn't actually enter the property, despite the fact that they saw that there was a window broken and neighbours reporting that his TV had been on for 48 hours straight. It would be another two days before the police actually entered Raymond Ford's flat. When they went inside, they found it dark and squalid. The officers carefully picked their way through the hallway, carefully stepping over what they thought was discarded trash and empty bottles of cider. What they found in the living room was horrific. Raymond Ford hadn't just been stabbed to death, he'd been butchered. His belly lay gaping open, his entrails had been pulled out and they'd been strung up around the room like bunting. As the officer's eyesight adjusted to the dim light in the flat, they realised that the dark objects that they'd stepped over in the hallway weren't litter. They were Raymond Ford's organs. An officer who attended the scene would later say, All the bits and pieces in the hallway, they were his internal organs. He'd removed practically every internal organ in his body. The police now had two bodies, but they assumed there were two more. Arkwright remained cagey though. He responded to their questions only in cryptic half-answers, enjoying the attention that it was getting him. It would take another two days before they finally found the bodies of Stasis Poitokis and Elsa Conradite. And this was only because they decided to stop at Arkwright's grandfather's house to see if he could shed any more light on Anthony's movements. With four bodies found, Arkwright decided to keep his little game going and he decided to tell the police that there was a fifth body in a lake somewhere. The police had to spend a lot of time searching for what eventually turned out to be an attention-seeking hoax. 
At the trial, Anthony Arkwright seemed to be completely unrepentant. He appeared in photos outside the courtroom, smirking for the cameras and laughing at the baying crowd of outraged public who had gathered to see him. One article describes him as being dressed like a punk, spiked hair, calf length jeans, dinner jacket and a red bow tie. Clearly he was loving the attention and he wanted to dress for the occasion. Eventually he admitted to killing Stasis Poidokas, Raymond Ford and Marcus Law, but for some reason he completely denied killing Elsa Conradite. He admitted that he had stood over her body with an axe in his hand, but he hadn't actually killed her. Now, I'm not sure why this is. It seems pretty likely that he did murder Elsa, but he always maintained his innocence on that one. Perhaps he just wanted to maintain some level of control over the proceedings, an attempt to keep the attention on himself for a bit longer. As a result, whilst Anthony Arkwright was found guilty of the murder of three men, Elsa Conradite's case was left to lie on file, hence the need for me to say allegedly earlier on in the video. Anthony Arkwright was given a whole life sentence. During sentencing, the judge, Justice Borum, said, I accept that you have had a deprived and disturbed childhood, but that cannot be any excuse for the appalling cruelty and apparent sadistic pleasure with which you carried out these offences. There is nothing in the medical evidence to suggest anything to mitigate what you've done. I have no doubt, reading the reports of three eminent psychiatrists and others, that you constitute a serious danger to the public and will remain so for a very long time to come. The horror of this case leaves me with no option but to pass life sentences. Detective Inspector Bob Meek, who had worked on the Arkwright case, said, From the day we brought him in for the Marcus Law murder, to the day that he was jailed, Arkwright seemed genuinely proud of what he had done. He expected everyone to revere him, to be fascinated by him. He was a messed up kid, desperate for attention. In his defected mind, he chose murder to get the attention he craved. He's the most dangerous person I've ever met in 25 years on the job. He should never get out. Anthony Arkwright believed that his name would go down in infamy. In reality, soon after his sentencing, he was mostly forgotten. I felt a bit conflicted about making the video because of that. Is it better to leave the case unmentioned? Talking about it is only really giving him the attention that he wants. Then again, I don't think one video is going to skyrocket Arkwright into the annals of crime history as the Rotherham Ripper. And it's always interesting to look at cases that don't get as much attention as the other ones. It looks like Anthony Arkwright will die in prison, jailed for life at the age of 22 and doomed to fall into obscurity. Thank you for watching the video. Handing out whole life sentences seems to be pretty rare in the UK, so it's always interesting to look through the cases and see what kind of people received them. I covered another lesser known one a while back, the case of Robert Maudsley, who has his own special prison cell built for him because he's considered so dangerous. Anyway, I hope you found it interesting. Huge thanks to everyone who's watching and especially to the patrons who have helped to support the channel. Thank you very much. Here's some more videos you might enjoy. Until next time, goodbye.